Hi, I'm John. And I'm Julie. We're the hosts of the Hartford Fund's Human-Centric Investing Podcast. Every other week, we're talking with inspiring thought leaders to hear their best ideas for how you can transform your relationships with your clients. Let's go. You know, Julie, it's interesting. When I think about the ways that financial professionals go about uh, prospecting, uh, remember the old days when they used to want to put an ad in the newspaper or invite somebody to the, you know, the dinner that was going to last three hours and you got everybody who came to eat, but not do much of else. And I'm sure you've participated in those client events where, you know, the advisor really hopes to get 40 or 50 people in the room and three of them show up, but they still have to pay for the room and the food. And so oftentimes prospecting uh, can be really frustrating for advisors, but I don't know. It seems to me like prospecting through these social platforms, especially like Facebook, uh, may have some great trade-offs in terms of cost and benefit. I don't know. What's your experience been? I wholeheartedly agree, John. I think oftentimes the planning and mechanics of some of the physical prospecting events can consume a, a, an advisor or a team or a practice. And it seems to me uh, although I'm a novice in terms of uh, social media prospecting, and I'm excited to learn more, like there are some efficiencies and some ways that a team could leverage this so that they can continue to reach a broader group of prospects um, through their, their current connections, but don't have to spend an inordinate amount of time and dollars doing it. So, Julie, it's for that reason why I th I'm really excited about sharing this episode. Uh, that we recorded with Stephen Boswell, president of the Oxley Institute, because I think it will give financial professionals some really practical, uh, practical steps to implement in terms of maybe a new way to prospect. So with that, let's go. We're delighted to be here today with Stephen Boswell. Stephen is the president of the Oxley Institute. In addition to overseeing the Oxley Institute's ongoing research on the affluent consumer, financial advisors, and insurance agents, Stephen delivers workshops throughout the U.S. on affluent marketing and practice management. He is also the author of a bi-weekly newsletter for wealthmanagement.com. Stephen, thank you so much for being here with us today. We're delighted to chat with you about Facebook. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Julie, and John as well. So Stephen, I have a question for you. I know when Facebook st first started coming on the scene, advisors were kind of questioning how do they use it to communicate to existing clients and kind of show them what their practice is about, get them to learn a little bit more about them as a person, not just a financial advisor. But it seemed like, uh, and still seems to me a little bit, that advisors are unaware of the prospecting potential that Facebook brings. Is that what you see at the Oxley Institute? We do, and I think more and more financial advisors are learning the intricacies of Facebook marketing. And we also see it from the other side. As a consumer, if you're on Facebook, you are seeing advertisements periodically, and you are wondering how all that works. You know it's effective, you see it in your news feed, and you're wondering if you're a financial advisor, how do I embrace some of this for our business? How do I make myself in the palm of people's hands uh, on Facebook? So I think the million dollar question is, if I am a financial professional and I haven't embraced this process, what, what do I do to get started in terms of using Facebook as a true marketing tool for my practice? When you're thinking about Facebook, you begin with the end in mind that if ultimately you want to get new business from this network, which is what we all want, right? We want it at Oxley. You all want it as financial professionals. You've got to think about how do we get there, right? And no different than any other marketing strategy. If you were to think about traditional marketing, let's say that you were going to be a good networker. You would first have to get out and meet a lot of people. You'd have to build relationships with them. You'd have to ask for the business in a compelling manner. And ultimately, you'd lose some and you'd win some. And ultimately, those are good prospectors. When we apply that mentality to Facebook, it works the same way. We've got to walk before we run. We've got to build uh, first some awareness of who we are. We've got to get some conversations rolling. And ultimately, we hope to have some, some real life prospects in the door. And Facebook's advertising, like if you were to go in behind the scenes and look at Ads Manager and Facebook, which is how, you know, uh, you, it, this is how you would go about advertising in a, in a more traditional way on Facebook. The objectives there are just that. It's awareness, engagement, or conversion. 
And you've got to really understand the three before you start to advertise. Awareness is just what it sounds like, that I want to make people in my area know exactly who I am. And there's certain benefits to that. Like if I'm a good financial advisor, I want everybody with money who lives within 25 miles of here to know exactly who I am. Not just to see my face, but perhaps to see me in recorded video, to hear my podcast, to see something I've written. I'd like them to see it every day if I could. And that raises awareness. It starts to build some followers on our page. The engagement phase is really about getting people to interact, letting them visit our website, letting them watch a significant portion of our videos, which is all good stuff. They're building familiar, familiarity with us. They're building trust. And finally, the conversion aspect of it is, I'd love to have their contact information. I'd love to be able to reach out to them by phone or by email to start the nurturing process. And so when all that's working in succession, you've got a growing audience that's responsive to your offers and ultimately you're able to follow up with them. But there's a real difference between lead generation and demand generation. If you come into social media in general, Facebook right now, and you're thinking more lead generation, it tends to be a short-term focus where you may have a high volume of leads, quote unquote, emails of people who want to engage with you, but they're low quality, perhaps lower net worth, perhaps less interest, they're harder to close, and, and it's not the ideal setup right? When you're looking at demand generation, it's a longer term play to where you're making people aware of you, you're building relationships, and ultimately when the timing is right for them, they're coming to you for financial advice. It's a model that we at Oxley have been playing for 15 years. It's exactly how we grow our business in terms of offering up free content for people to engage with. And as they like it, there may be becoming, there may become a need at some point for our services. And it's, it, it makes it to where you shift from making outbound calls, trying to find business to where people are calling you and wanting to engage your services. Stephen, when we think about prospecting, is there a reason why Oxley says that Facebook is really the social platform of choice? I mean, does it, does it have to do with the potential audience we can reach? Is it the flexibility of the platform? Is it both? Why Facebook versus Instagram or who know, uh, LinkedIn or any of these other platforms? Yeah, Facebook has not only a larger audience than those other platforms, it is a slightly older audience and an audience that engages that network more often. So LinkedIn thing, for example, if, if you're a recruiter or if you're in sales, LinkedIn is a network you'd use pretty often. If you're a, a consumer, an affluent investor, LinkedIn's not something that you go onto all the time. It's still a great network. We can get into that in another episode. But, uh, but Facebook is something they're engaging with constantly. You know, the average Facebook user is on there multiple times a day. It's not as if they're, they're logging in once and checking in and moving on. So they're a more receptive audience to an awareness building campaign. If you want to be in front of people, Facebook's where it's at. Now, over time, will that migrate? You know, obviously the trends are in favor right now of networks like Instagram. Uh, yeah, we'll be there too, right? You, you, you want to embrace the networks as uh, they evolve to match your ideal client profile. But for most financial advisors, the ideal profile is a client of, uh, that, that's on Facebook. Stephen, I really liked your analogy of how you went through the sales process. And it's one drip planting of another seed, another drip, another seed. And, and I've never thought about Facebook in that way. In my mind, I've always thought about it. It's, it's quick. It's direct. It's sort of a one-hit wonder. And, and then we move on to the next activity. And, and that's really opened my mind to the possibilities and, and really kind of walked me through how this can be a really interesting longer term sales cycle, especially to target the right clients that truly fit, you know, the practice that I have built. I'm curious, you mentioned something called lead generation. And I admittedly am not a Facebook aficionado. Um, I will admit I'm not even on Facebook as right, right this moment. Um, that will change soon. But how does that work? What is lead generation? If you, if you would educate me, I would be very appreciative. Yeah, absolutely. So let's say you're in a position where you've already built a following, you already have a robust presence, you put out good content, and you're saying, you know what would be great is if I got some actual names of people who have interest in my services from Facebook. Well, they love to make that happen for you. And Legion on Facebook would work as follows, typically would work as follows, that you're going to offer up, if you're the financial advisor, you're going to offer up something of value to the consumer. And if they think it's valuable enough, they'll give you their information in exchange for it. So 
That thing of value may be your time that you're willing to offer up a 30 minute consultation with them. It may be a recorded webinar that is valuable enough for them to want to offer up their contact information for it. It could be a physical copy of a book. We, we've seen all different varieties of this. Uh, but the way it works in Facebook is that may come through your news feed, you know, you know, the number of posts that you're scrolling through, and it may say, download this white paper today on XYZ for business owners. And you're thinking, well, hey, I'm a business owner. This looks pretty enticing. Well, Facebook, the mechanisms within Facebook make that really easy. Facebook obviously already knows your name. They know your email. They often know your phone number. So they will pre-populate those lead forms for you. So if I click download this white paper, Facebook will already pre-populate my name and email and phone number. And all I've got to do is hit submit in order to download that white paper. So Facebook as a platform has made it fairly frictionless for the consumer to download those kind of things and to serve you up as the financial advisor, that person's information. Now, the real key point there is a lead in that context I put it in quotes for a reason that these aren't people who've raised their hand and said necessarily, I've got money and I want a new financial advisor. You've got to sort through it. Uh, but what you're able to do when you gather their contact information is moved from rented space to owned space. And without getting too far into the weeds, I own the space when I have your contact information. I can reach out to you whenever I want. I'm at Facebook's mercy when I only have you through advertising. I've got to consistently pay them to get in front of you. Stephen, you mentioned earlier the difference between lead generation, which you said is usually kind of a short-term engagement, and demand generation, which you said is maybe a longer-term process. Can you uh, just elaborate on that? So you just talked about lead generation. How does that differ from demand generation? And how should I, as a financial professional, be thinking about demand generation? Yeah, if I, if I were thinking lead generation as a financial advisor, let's say I get right into the network and I think, I want business out of this. I want to put in $100 today and get $500 out in terms of return. I would be thinking a short-term strategy like offering up uh, a quick video. You can watch the extended version. If you give me your contact information, I'd get a handful of low-quality leads back and I would try to nurture them into something significant. And it's typically a failed strategy. I mean, there are ways to make that work with a more significant lead offer, a uh, lead magnet bigger budgets to make that work. You certainly see some success stories out there of some bigger brands making it happen. Uh, but if I'm, if it's, if it's my money on the line here, and this is what we do at Oxley, I'm playing the demand gen game to where I'm putting out consistent streams of helpful content that have you attached to me until the timing is right. Until if you're a consumer looking for financial advice, you've changed jobs, you sold your business, you, you have something in motion that might warrant you reaching out to a financial advisor I want to be in your head. I want to be the one you're thinking about when you're thinking financial advice. So you mentioned the word content, and I know that's a conversation that I have very frequently with financial professionals, no matter what platform they're considering in terms of, of putting themselves out there to ultimately grow their, their practice. Where, what is a best practice for gathering this content? I always bristle a little bit when I hear advisors saying that they've spent a month writing their own newsletter or, you know, creating all of this content. And of course, I'm sure there's a balance so that it, it feels personal. But could you share with us some great sources for that content that are maybe efficient and effective for a financial professional that, that again, has so many moving parts within the practice that they can't sit down, stop the clock for a month and create a whole bunch of content for themselves? Yeah, I mean, years ago, we would have given the exact opposite advice of what I'll about to give you right, I'm about to give you right now. Years ago, I would have said, do not waste your time writing articles and books and stuff, because we would have a lot of people coming to us and saying, you know, marketing strategy this year is I'm going to ghost write a book, and this is going to be my big hit. And I've never seen it be a big hit for someone. So uh, a lot has changed. And I would say, when you're thinking about the way consumers find financial advisors now, Sure, many of them do it traditionally, and they ask a friend or family member, who do you recommend, uh, and then look you up online. But there are even more now uh, than ever that go to the web initially to look up and find financial advisors. So if you don't have a presence there that includes some personal content from you, articles or videos, you're not going to make the kind of impression that leads to new business. So, you know, it, it used to be that having a basic website and a LinkedIn profile would be enough credibility. People could look you up and see who you are. Nowadays, 
there are so many options out there that if you don't have some compelling content that you've actually had a hand in, people pass you by. And you can tell immediately, if you look through your LinkedIn or Facebook feed right now, you can tell immediately the difference between a piece of content that the advisor had their hand in creating versus one that was found elsewhere. And it's not to say that you never use third-party content, content uh, that you find from Hartford Funds, content that you find from your firm. All that stuff's great. But you also just want to have a, at least a splash of your own personal, uh, your personality that, that's thrown in there because as you're thinking about establishing that demand, part of it comes from being knowledgeable. The other part of it comes from being likable, that they see your content regularly and think, I can see myself working with this person. Stephen, can you think offhand of any success stories, specific advisors or financial professionals who uh, kind of made the commitment to demand generation and have seen it make a difference in their business? Yeah, we've, we've got a, uh, I've got one that's fresh in my mind because I, I heard about it yesterday. This is from a financial advisor who'd been in some video programming with us. And his takeaway was that he's landing more business right now through his videos that he posts through his social channels than any other technique he's trying, than getting referrals through hosting client events or webinars. He said his videos are getting passed around from his clients to their friends. His videos are bringing in people that he would have never met in real life that he's meeting through his Facebook page. So when you start to hear stories like that, you know where the future is headed. You know, people of the, the you know, a certain generation are spending a lot more time, younger people are spending a lot more time on their phones than, than other generations. So when they uh, you know, start to make more money, when they start to get inheritance, what are they going to do? They're looking on their phones to find financial advisors. So a, a person like that, uh, who's doing the regular video content is in a lot better position this year, five years from now, 10 years from now to gain market share than someone who's just not embraced it yet. So Stephen, let's take that example because I think that's a great success story. That advisor puts the video out there and receives a list of individuals that where it's been passed around to friends of clients. They have this list of names, numbers, emails. What do they do with it? How, how what are some best practices on how that advisor is reaching out? Are they saying, I see you watched my video on Facebook, or is it a little more finessed? I'm curious. I think sometimes, you know, I, I, I'm thinking about this big picture, but tactically, when I'm picking up the phone or pulling up that blank email, what am I saying after I receive these leads? Well, you're hitting on a good point, which is just lead nurturing. And it doesn't often come at the, on the heels of a video. A video would be more of demand gen, that you watch my video, you think enough of me, maybe it was sent to you by a friend of yours who uses my services, and you think enough of it to call me or, or reach out. Uh, but let's say it was a more traditional lead gen mechanism, like offering up a white paper in exchange for their email information or their phone number. You're going to look at a sequence of nurturing them, that very few people on the heels of reading that white paper are going to call you and say, hey, I'm in. Like, that, where do I sign up? Like you want to maintain and uh, you know some positioning in front of them. Some of that will be through uh, engaging with them on social, right? Some of that will be adding them to your email newsletter, and ideally, uh, the same takes place there. That you're able to educate them through that newsletter, but also to let them get to know you a little bit through some you know personal uh, things happening with your team or your own uh, personal insights about what's happening in the markets, for example. There's a blend of phone calls. Like you're, you're trying to think of a variety of ways to stay in front of somebody until they tell you they're not interested, which isn't a, a difference. Uh, there's a difference between that and hounding them, but you want to stay in front of them until the timing is right. It's called lead nurturing. I was going to ask you about that topic of lead nurturing. If, if we rush in too quick, is there a concern about, uh, you know, that thin line between cool and creepy, right? Like, how did he know this about me? And when, when does the financial professional know too much information? Is that something we need to be sensitive of, especially if we haven't worked with these platforms before? I think you want to be mindful of your target market. And if you're targeting, I'll give you, here's another example. So there's a financial advisor that we worked with who had a, a book that he really liked. And he would say, if you fill out this form, I'll mail you the book. And people would fill out that form. He had a lot of people fill out that form. But he would say, I'm not going to just send it to them. I'm going to make sure they have a conversation with me first. I'll call under the premise of, like, I want to verify your information, but I'm going to make you have a phone call with me first. And the key to his success uh, for him was 
I would call them as soon as I got the lead. Like I see it come in on my phone and I'd call them. And he said, otherwise people would forget that they even filled it out. They wouldn't remember. And so I would call them immediately and work for him. Now he was focused on a lower net worth market, a good, good client for him, 250,000, maybe 500,000 investable. Uh, I would make the opposite case for those who were five to 10 million. Let's say that that's your space. You don't want to call those people up immediately. You don't want to hound them by email. You want to be a little bit more uh, you know, soft in your sales skills. You want to give them the opportunity to come to you by putting your video content in front of them, for example, uh, by perhaps inviting them to some webinars where you have experts from your firm on the line, but uh, things that are a little softer. I've heard throughout what you've shared with us today that for those financial professionals that are engaging in this, that personalization of their content is very important. Consistency of posts, um, nurturing the leads are obviously really crucial ingredients in this recipe for success. Are there any other best practices that uh, advisors should consider if they're looking to get more leads on Facebook? Yeah, I would say that you're only, you know, you're only going to be as good as those you follow. And so if part of the strategy is you, you want to get better at Facebook marketing, follow other people who are really good at it. Take note of what they post, how often, how much energy they personally put into it. Because there are financial advisors who do a really good job of this. Keep in touch with what they're up to. And it's a good step towards getting better yourself. So, Stephen, let's just say... Uh as we think about upcoming marketing initiatives, that I make a commitment to uh, improving my, my presence in Facebook, establish my business page. Now I want to make that commitment to demand generation, which probably starts with lead generation. I've got an idea of what I'd like to do for content. Uh, what's the first step getting started with Facebook lead generation? Yeah, it is taking note of what you've done previously that has had some impact. And the reason I say that is when you're talking about lead generation, that's the hardest part of all this, right? I, I would personally, I would be a financial advisor. If I had the perfect formula that worked every time that could double my investment and put it into Facebook and all of a sudden you're spitting out clients out the back end. Um, it's not that simple. It takes a ton of trial and error. And one of the things that helps in trial and error is an understanding of what you've done previously that had some success. So, if I were going to get into a big lead gen campaign and I was going to put in hundreds or thousands of dollars to make this work, to get a volume of names at the top of the funnel that lead to some good business down at the bottom, I want to do that with some historical perspective about the topics and the audience that have performed. So for example, if I can look back and say, well, the things that I targeted at business owners were really effective, I'm going to go after that market. If I can look back and say, well, it's really the dentist uh, content that I put out or the content that was on uh, millennials and Gen Xers with money that that worked better for me. That's the audience that I'm going to target. So, you know, it, it is, uh, it's interesting when you ask, like, where do you start? It's a constant experimentation. So yeah, I look at, I, I talk a lot about our marketing here at Oxley, just because, not because we're, we're perfect at it, but because we spend a lot of time on it. And I can say every month still to this day, we are experimenting with styles of ads, uh, video versus graphics, length of video. Like we experiment constantly as a means to finding some things that are going to be high performers uh, for this month. So it sounds to me like if we're going to make this a priority, our Facebook marketing, that we need to make a longer term commitment, not just think we're going to post one thing here and there and expect to, you know, receive, uh, you know, all these, all this feedback. But regardless of the feedback, what you said about trial and error means that we need to commit for some period of time to put a consistent effort into generating good content, personalizing it to an effect, and, and letting it go for a while before we begin to reap perhaps some of the harvest, right? Yeah, and, and I'm not saying going in blind and, and that you know we're going to put money into this indefinitely and, and not expect any tangible results out of it, because that's not the case. You, you want to be getting business from this. Uh, but but I do think it takes a mindset of experimentation, being willing to waste a little bit of money, you know, and not you know. And what I mean by that is, you you can't expect every ad, every boosted post to get immediate payoff, and you've got to be okay with that as part of the process. No different than uh, you know hosting a client event. You don't expect all of them to pay off in new business, but in aggregate, they do. And 
I think when you go into that long-term mindset that says the future is that people are interacting online, the future is that people are finding brands uh, online, that I want to be there in the most compelling way possible. Whatever my firm will allow me to do, I want to be into it. Well, for those of you that are excited to continue to learn more about lead generation within Facebook and hopefully to cut through a bit of the trial and error uh, through Stephen and his team's hard work and, and diligence throughout many years and working with so many financial professionals in our industry, feel free to visit hartfordfunds.com slash Facebook for many best practices and tips in, in terms of engaging Facebook in the most efficient and effective way. Thank you again, Stephen, for sharing all of your insight and words of wisdom with us today. I know that I continue to learn so much. Yeah, thanks again for having me. These are always so much fun. Thanks for listening to the Hartford Funds Human-Centric Investing Podcast. If you'd like to tune in for more episodes, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube. And if you'd like to be a guest and share your best ideas for transforming client relationships, email us at guestbooking at hartfordfunds.com. We'd love to hear from you. Talk to you soon.